All right, guys, girls, men, women, everybody. Um, my name is Howard Kelly. I used to be the editor of Hot Bike back during the time when Hot Bike was exploding in the industry. Um, it's really important for you to understand that back then, the there was no internet, right? We're talking about from like 95 to 2004 time frame. There was no internet. There was no how do you get your, well, 2004, there was an internet, but in the beginning, the 95, 96 time frame, the Harley world was exploding. You couldn't buy a Harley anywhere and the custom bikes were coming out. And then the fact that everybody wanted a Harley made everybody want to customize their Harley. And 80 inch engines, 80 inch Evos, right? That was a big deal because people were still getting past shovel heads and pan heads. Not that you need to get past them but they were embracing the Evo and then the bigger Evos came along and people were building 96 inch motors and that was huge. And you have to understand back then it was a whole different world. So what I did is I grabbed three issues. Um, one from 96, one from 98 and one from 2003. And I just wanted you to see some of the differences in what we did and some of the similarities. Now remember too, we were trying to sell magazines on newsstands. So if you look at these covers, all three of them, one thing's prominent, the name of the magazine. But you'll notice in the 96 one, Hot Bike had kind of a pinkish purple into the tint. And it wasn't as prominent as all white letters. That was actually something we had to learn how to make the magazine stand out. Because another thing that most people don't remember from back then is there were like 15 Harley magazines. There was Hot Bike, and there was Hot Rod Harleys, and there was American Iron, and there was V-Twin, and there was Easy Riders, and there was Big Twin, and there was Iron Horse, and, and, and it just went on and on and on, and Thunder Press, and, and all these different magazines, Ironworks, and, and they came out of the woods. There were magazines everywhere, so you needed to stand out on the newsstand, and you'll notice, the blurbs, which are the words on the cover, there are always things that you think, you know, on a quick two second look, would that get me to read the magazine? And I didn't plan it this way, but if you look at what I brought out here, three magazines that I grabbed, each one of them had a win a motorcycle or win a sweepstakes thing. It was another reason to try and get people to buy the magazines. So. The first one we're looking at is the December 96 issue with a Borgette built bike that had a car tire on the back. Roger used to use a jack shaft to transfer everything out through the drive so the tire could still be centered even though he was running a car tire. What was amazing about this bike was it was an aluminum frame which was unheard of. He had put these little cutouts in the back for the, you could see the tire through the rear fender. Back then, the crazier you made the bike, the better it was. So opening up the magazine, first thing I want you to see is a big two-page ad from Pro One. Pro One made billet parts, and then they started making motorcycles and motorcycle frames and kit bikes and things like that. But that two-page ad, that made you a big deal in the motorcycle industry because if your two-page ad was in... Hot Bike and two or three of the other magazines. That was huge because again, remember back then, no website to go look at the parts that were available. So I want you to see too, I opened up to um, one of my first editorials. That picture of me sitting on my Buell with my Harley racing jacket on, that was taken by my good friend, Courtney Hollowell, and he posed that picture he was trying to make me look less like a sport bike guy and more like a Harley magazine editor because as everyone knew back then, I had a Buell, I had a GSXR. Um, I had originally started at Motorcyclist Magazine before I got an opportunity to go work at Hot Rod Harleys. And the first thing that I did was how can we make this Harley magazine look more like Motorcyclist or Cycle World? And I used to push real hard for riding and stuff like that. In fact, when I had my interview for being the editor of Hot Bike, I sat in a room with Steve Stilwell, who was at the time the VP at McMullen Argus way back then. Um, 
he handed me a stack of hot bikes and he said, what would you do different in these magazines? And he handed me a legal pad and he left the room and I thumbed through the magazines, even though I knew the magazines because they were my competition when I was working at Hot Rod Harley's. And when he came back, I had written one thing on the piece of paper. I would put riding shots. There is no action in this magazine. There's no animation. There's no make you want to go out and ride. Steve reached across the table, shook my hand and said, when do you want to start? It was an amazing thing. But anyway, so going into the pages of this magazine, the ads were a big deal. Again, no internet. This was how you found things by going through the magazines. Um, we had a news section that talked about what was going on in the industry. And in this particular case, you see a picture of Mike Corbin announcing that he's going to host a Hollister rally up in Hollister, California, bringing the Hollister rally back. It was a big deal. Um, this Harley ad was kind of awesome because it was trying to say, you know, don't use aftermarket parts, only use Harley parts. And that was a big deal back then. Um, oh, check this bike out. So this bike was, um, I mean, this is what's cool about the magazines back then, right? The, the bikes were, were custom and you got to see these great photos of real custom bikes, which yes, you can see them on the internet now, but it just wasn't the same thing as seeing these big photos. Now, people that know the industry really well, by the way, you can see my hand in some of these photos. I was in a hurry to flip through them. Um, this was painted and, and kind of put together by Andy Anderson from Anderson Studios. And if you've been around the industry for a long time, you know Andy Anderson. He's one of the most famous painters. So cool to see this bike. And then there was this shovel head, right? Because remember... It was only in 84 that the Evo came out. So it was only 10 years since the shovel head went away. So cool, we featured a shovel head. Now, another thing you'll notice in this issue, we were still using up a lot of the stuff that had been shot before I became the editor. Um, so we still had a lot of studio photography. Studio photography is beautiful, but I always wanted all the bikes that we featured once we started shooting new stuff that I was responsible for, I wanted it to be real and the bikes had to ride. But there's no saying that this cool full page shot of that shovel head, just the way it is, wouldn't be torn out and put in somebody's garage because likely it was. And if you wanted to be a mechanic back then, there was ads for schools you could go to to be a motorcycle mechanic. Stuff we don't have now. So there's a Ness ad from back then. Billet parts were a big deal because we had just reached the point of billet parts being available and bolt on stuff to make your bike just a little different than everybody else. Um, the Yost Power Tube and the Vance and Hines ad. The Yost Power Tube, if you, if you know somebody that's been around since the 80s, 90s, um, that used to work with CV carbs and stuff, you ask them about that. But Check out that little Vance and Hines ad. Vance and Hines was just a, just a, I mean, a big deal, but they were just a small little exhaust manufacturer back then. And look at that, a Bay Area Custom Cycles Ron Sims ad. On the same page um, as the news section, and then the gearheads section came in. Um, gearheads was this thing we did where we asked our readers to write in and share little tips about what they did and how they worked on their bikes, or things that could save somebody a problem. And it was, it was like the internet before the internet existed. Now, another thing that we took real serious back in the days of magazines was tech and explaining tech. And you'll notice, uh, actually Kip Woodring did this article, but really detailed dyno charts and specifications and all the stuff you would need to really know how to do what was being done or at the very least, understand what you were being charged for. Um, and then the buyer's guides, right? Buyer's guides were gigantic back then. You know why? No paid ads on Facebook, no paid ads on Instagram. This is how you got people to see your product. And it went on and on for pages. And this was such a big deal for so many of the part manufacturers. Now, let's talk about this bike. This, if anybody recognizes the little logo here, this is one of Jesse James' bikes. 
Very cool, very clean, shot in our studio. Um, I actually like this bike a lot. I remember it really well. And uh, there's a picture of Jesse, as always, happy being in the magazines. He's always happy. You can see that smile on, oh, no smile, never mind. Um, but a cool bike, a really cool bike, way back, way back. Oh, look at that, Borgettes, with a full-page ad for all the different custom bikes you could buy from them. These were called production customs, and people were buying these because there was still a waiting list to buy a Harley, sometimes a year wait to go in and buy a new bike. And this bike, Harold Ponarelli, another name that, I'm not going to drop names as I go through this, names that have been around for a really long time, and you still hear them every once in a while. And again, the idea of these photos in the magazine, just they brought these bikes to life. Now, this Borgette bike that we featured on the cover, we shot this out in Sturgis. And to get that burnout shot, first of all, this bike was ridiculously cool with the aluminum frame, the car tire, that kind of stuff. But, oops. Um, it, it was just so cool back then to have something like this. But this is the story, right? And I told you there'd be little stories along the way. There's Roger. And the way we got that burnout shot is the tire would hook up so quick. We were putting water and putting stuff down to get the tire to spin. But because the front tire was so skinny and the back tire was so big, Roger had to stand in front of the bike, hold it still until the back tire would start spinning. Steve would then pin the throttle. Roger would dive out of the way and we would start taking photos as quick as we could. We did it two or three times before we thought Roger was going to die. But this kind of stuff, you know, we were doing this with film back then too. So remember, right, we didn't have digital. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have a way to quickly look and see if it works. So we had to do it over and over to make sure we got what we were looking for. Um, and now back to giveaway bike stuff, right? We were doing a giveaway with custom chrome. And what's important about this, not so much the giveaway bike, but if you look really closely, I remember when I went up to photograph this, look really closely. There was a guy that worked at custom chrome and his name was Donnie. And he was a master of the mullet. Check it out. I mean, it's just, it's a beautifully done mullet for back in the day. And then there was the Sturgis coverage. Now, this was our version of Instagram before Instagram existed, right? This was photo after photo after photo, and we were limited on space. So unfortunately, the photos were small, but we were trying to pack in as many of the names and faces and bikes that we could possibly fit in here. Now, on this page, you'll see something that was only done once, only one take, only happened one time. And this was for use in Ron Sims' catalog. Ron asked me to ride one of his bikes with him to be in his catalog. And he asked me to do it without a helmet and a jacket, which was as foreign to me as it could possibly be. Because I lived in a helmet and a jacket and gloves and all that stuff. But if you look really closely at this photo, you'll notice that both Ron and I are wearing high top leather sneakers, white. And you'll notice that many years later, Sons of Anarchy came out. And what did they do? They put the cool guy in white high top leather sneakers because they were copying me and Ron. Anyway, that's something you'll never see again, me riding without gear. And then there was this cool photography stuff again that I would talk about, right? Look at that shot of that bike with the ape hangers. And it just, you can't get that on a phone screen. It just doesn't work, right? And on your computer, it's kind of hard to carry out to the garage when you want to look at it full size. So the magazines mattered back then. But also, this was something else that was a really big deal because, again, I'm going to ad nauseum say this, no internet. So people would send their bikes in to be part of our Reader's Showcase. And when your bike was featured in Reader's Showcase, it was braggable to your friends. It was something you ran around and told people about. You were like, this is the coolest thing in the world. My bike is in Hot Bike this month. Now, it might not be the five-page feature, but my bike is in Hot Bike. And that was really cool, and we loved doing that. Now, another thing that's worth looking at now, all these small little ads. These small little ads, like, I can't tell you how many people's businesses 
from these little ads grew to be a big deal. But those little ads, back of the magazine, when you read the article and you heard... Okay, so really this is incredibly professional. As you know, the phone rang right in the middle of when I was talking, but um, I'm just gonna pick it up from there. So these little ads made a huge difference in people's business over the years. And it was really cool to see that. And then um, closing this out for this issue, I want you to see this ad here um, from Nemco. Those of you that are still in the motorcycle world now buying parts, think about that name Nemco. Where is it? Oh, that's right, it's now Biker's Choice. But back then it was Nemco and that was kind of cool. And then on the back cover, which by the way, back cover was a prominent place to buy an ad, was an ad for custom chrome and some of the cool parts that I'm pretty sure John Reed designed those. And if you, know, if you don't know the name John Reed, be sure to do some research on John Reed because that's an amazingly talented craftsman that will never see another person like that ever. So moving on to the March 98 issue of the magazine, on the cover, riding, because this is when I finally got to have all the cabinets emptied of all the other bikes we'd done, and we were a couple years into doing Hot Bike My Way, um, a panhead soft tail. That was just unusual for back then, because it had all the cool stylings of what made a soft tail popular back then with the stretch tank and the slightly bigger fenders and the low profile and the wire wheels and lots of cool little trim pieces, but it was a panhead. So we put it on the cover. And then as you open the magazine up, there's an ad for Arlen Ness selling complete polished engines, ready to go, make your bike a show bike, drop in a new engine. It was a really cool concept. And then some of the ads that were in the magazine, like from PTS Cycles, Look at, I mean, imagine trying to buy parts from that, but people did all the time because even that small little photo told somebody what it was going to look like. They'd call somebody on the phone and there were customer service people that knew motorcycles working at these places and they talked you through the right part to buy for your bike. Now, this issue, we announced Hot Bike Performance Alley and Hot Bike Performance Alley was basically... Um, Dave Withrow and I flew down to Daytona and we talked to a guy that owned a car dealership and we convinced him to rent us his parking lot so we could host vendors in a big parking lot. So it was like the pages of Hot Bike coming to life and advertisers that were with the magazine and you can see those names on the page next to that Hot Bike Performance Alley picture. They were there. And through the course of doing this, I'm sure I will come up with the issue where we covered that Daytona. And I will tell you some stories about Hot Bike Performance Alley, but it was interesting, it was fun. And again, this was a time where you just didn't see everything unless you went to these events or you went and bought every magazine on the rack that covered the event because that was how you got to see everything that went on. No Instagram, no Facebook, I keep saying it. But it's true, and imagine getting your information once a month from a magazine. And then imagine knowing you could go to Daytona and meet all the different bike builders and vendors that you'd been reading about for years in the magazine. It was We were literally bringing those pages to life. It was a really cool thing. So then we got back into some bikes, and look, an FXR. Well, it's a Kenny Boyce frame FXR, but still, it was a rubber mount. FXR style, and it was a custom, and that was incredibly popular back then. It was just the thing. So going into this, right, we talked about tech heavily during my time at Hot Bike. We really got into the tech, and we dug in, and we really showed people how something would get installed and details. And then moving on from that, we're moving into... A road test. It was something else that I really wanted Hot Bike to be known for was to ride motorcycles and really put them through their pace and test it. Now, if you knew me back then, my reputation was there's not a bike that I can't do a burnout or a wheelie on. And I, I did whenever possible. But I also wanted the other guys that worked at the magazine to be involved in it. 
So in this page, Courtney Hallowell is doing a big burnout on that Buell, and Mike Reynolds is doing a great wheelie, and it was exciting, and it was alive, and it was it was a way to to take a guy that might be reading this magazine, you know, in the middle of winter in the Midwest where it snowed. And I know because I lived in La Crosse for like five years, right? It snowed in the middle of the winter and you weren't going riding. But if you could see some cool pictures of people riding bikes and, and bikes in action, that was great back then. So then we found this other bike that we had to put in the magazine, this panhead that was born out of a guy having a set of cases in his garage. But also notice the ad here, right? Performance. Everything was performance back then because you couldn't just buy a big engine and have a fast bike. In order to have a fast bike, you had to do motor work. And motor work could be simple, could be complicated. But everybody wanted a faster bike. Now, Milwaukee Iron built this Sportster, and um, man, there's some stories about Milwaukee Iron, but they were this cool little shop run by this guy, Randy Simpson, and he was laid back and just, just a kickback guy, and you'd meet him at shows, and he'd be, hey, Howard, how you doing? And nothing bothered him, and nothing stressed him, and he built this cool bike, and he was in the magazine with his stuff, and... Um, there's a lot of stories about Randy, but we're not going to get into them today. We'll get into them in some of the other issues as I find his stuff. But this cool little Sportster. Oh, look at that ad. Um, the uh, Mama Jamma Fenders from West Coast Choppers. Back when Jesse was just releasing his metal fenders. So that's how far back that goes, right? That's March of 98. And then tech again, right? If everything was tech. How could we teach our readers more about working on their bike? How could we teach them photo by photo by photo what to do, how to do it? Um, now we get back to that Panhead, which again, I thought it was just such a killer bike. It was beautiful and it was cool, a soft tail Panhead. You just never saw that. Now, going back to that whole importance of the magazine thing, look at that photo, right? Imagine that's a full page of the magazine. Just that cool look of that bike, all right? How many people do you think of the hundreds of thousands that Red Hot Bike pulled that page out and stuck it up on a wall in their garage? Because it's just cool. And imagine again, one of those people in the middle of the winter seeing this nice sunny photo of a beautiful bike. That was what we wanted to do back then. And then of course tech and how do we help people, but what I really want you to see here is the Ultra Custom Cycles ad. Biker's Choice, Ultra Custom Cycle, Vinny. Man, there's going to be some stories about Vinny as we get to some of the road tests on his bikes. People that know Vinny and people that know Ultra, they've got their own stories. And if you ever run into somebody, <laughs> they will tell you stories. So then we get to another event. And again, how we covered the events, as many photos as possible. What could we show? How could we talk about? Because people didn't get to all the events, but we tried to cover it the best we could with all the photos, anything we could do to tell a story. And I hope you're noticing some of the ads as we go through here. Some of the people that have been in business for forever, some of the names that made the industry back then. And it keeps going and going and going with the photos and the weird ads, but those ads, right, they made the industry. Now, little side note, um, MCC was Pat Matter's Minneapolis Custom Cycle. Um, Pat Matter was a well-known member of the Hells Angels in Minnesota. Um, you'll notice we put an ad for the AMA under Pat's ad because that was kind of irony and fun because, you know, the AMA didn't like clubs and the clubs didn't like the AMA, but it just seemed kind of fun to put those two ads on the same page. And on the other page, you'll notice there's an ad from Paco because Paco goes back way before 98. Um, but Paco has always been a part of the custom bike world. And we had a big dog that we were doing a long-term test on. Yeah, that was the name of the company, Big Dog. 
and they were out of Wichita, Kansas. They were actually owned um, by Sheldon Coleman, who was an heir to the Coleman Cooler fortune, but he loved motorcycles. So he started his own little company. And in this case, we had one of their test bikes back then that was a full on what people called a Harley clone back then. Um, but they were doing some upgrades for their model year. So they asked the guy that did all their tech work to fly out to California and update our bike with the next year's worth of upgrades. So that was kind of cool. And again, it showed that we rode the bikes and we rode the bikes so much that manufacturers wanted to make sure we had the right upgrades to look at. Um, this bike, Todd Madison from a company named Billet For You out in Colorado. Thing is gorgeous, right? Just super clean, super just beautiful. And the photo, again, making you want to be on this bike. But those bikes, and this is important to remember too, back then, these bikes weren't built to be the bike you rode every day to go get groceries and things like that. These bikes were fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars back then, and what they were was the equivalent of like a Boyd Coddington hot rod. Maybe not at that level, but some of them were at that level. But it was the idea that your custom bike that you took out on a Sunday or you took to a show or you did whatever, everybody noticed it. And how could you not notice stuff like this? Look at those wheels. A simple two-spoke design. Like, how crazy is that? And the photos keep going with this bike. And it was just, it was a beautiful bike and we shot it in a great location. And now... Delmar. Delmar was an event that took place in Southern California at the Delmar Horse Track. And it was flat track racing on the horse track and it was a bike show. And it was so much fun and so many cool things happened and so many cool builders showed up and the racing was amazing and the industry came alive on the West Coast. For a couple days which was unusual because if you think about all the major events that went on in the motorcycle world it was daytona and laconia and it was sturgis and it was the ohio rallies and everything was was away from the west coast except for laughlin and then delmar came along and it was like our chance to have a cool event and it was an amazing time it really really was and what's funny is Back then, I tried to really emphasize the flat track racing, and the readers didn't care. They just, they didn't care. They wanted to see fat fendered soft tails and stuff like that, and that was cool. You guys were the readers, so the readers got to have what they wanted, but now, look what's popular, right? Flat track racing. Um, I wanted you to see this ad just because, yeah, there was no internet, so how could I pack 150 parts that I want to talk about on two pages. This is what it looked like. It wasn't necessarily pretty, but it was a big deal to have that. Oh, and by the way, this was Chaparral. Now, anybody that knows Chaparral um, out here in Southern California, they are not known for their V-twin stuff. But the guy that ran Chaparral was the master of the catalog. And he would mail a catalog to your house for mail order parts, for whatever thing you wanted. And he was amazing with it. And he advertised in the magazines and, and he did more mail order business than anybody. And if you wanted to buy a part for your motorcycle, he'd get it for you. So just wanted you to see that, it's kind of cool. Um, more Delmar, um, more cool little ads worth seeing. Now, <laughs> this was fun. Um, this was a bold on custom thing that we did where, again, everybody wanted their bike to look a little different. So we dealt with Milwaukee Iron on this um, and we had them take some photos of installing a couple of their custom fenders on a bike. And it involved cutting fender struts off and bolting on a solid metal fender. And oh, before I go on, Ron Sims, another ad from him, big Again, Sims is still around now, and it matters when you look at those things. But back to Randy's article. So all the steps involved in how to make your bike have this fender, including a picture of two guys standing on one of the fenders to show how strong it was. Now, across from that, 
was when the marketing started getting a little crazy in the um, production custom world. Titan was a big name in the production custom world. And Titan got to be a bigger name when they gave one of their bikes to Playboy to give to their Playmate of the Year, which created a partnership for them. So now you'd go to the Titan booth at all the big rallies and there'd be Playboy Playmates around to sign autographs and take pictures. And it, it was just a different world back then. But man, some of those things were fun. Now, Gene Cook was an amazing guy and he was a, a sales rep for drag specialties and he covered Southern California and he was, he was just a passionate motorcyclist and he was part of the hamsters and just, just an all around great guy. And I used to see him at all the shows and we used to go have lunch in Southern California once in a while and just hang out and just an amazing guy. And he had this cool little hot rod FXR and we took some photos of it and we put it in the magazine and unfortunately Gene passed, but man, what an amazing guy. And if you want to see one of his bikes, um, Brian Clock at Clockworks has restored one of his old FXRs and he takes it around to all the shows with him. He's got it on his website. Well worth looking at. Now, uh, a little bit more with Gene's bike, but also Samson Exhaust. Um, Samson Exhaust made some of the loudest pipes that you could get for your bike back then. And Kenny was proud of that. His pipes were loud. His pipes made noise. His pipes made your bike look cool. And the exhaust wars, and they really were wars back then, were crazy. Because there were a thousand different pipes you could get for your bike. There was just no end to it. Now, moving on a little bit, cool, notice Landmark, a bunch of billet parts, Daytech, a frame manufacturer. But what I want you to notice is those new products up at the very top, those mirrors that had speedometer and a tachometer and all your idiot lights built into them. Part of that super clean thing that everybody was going for on their bikes was not having gauges. But you know what? It's nice to have a speedometer. It's nice to have a tachometer. It's nice to have an odometer to get an idea how far you went on a tank of gas. We put a set of those mirrors on one of our bikes, and I'll find that article and talk about that, but they were really cool for their time. All right, so picking up with this cool little shifter thing from MidUSA. Harleys have a plus or minus fit. Everybody knows that. Things are loose. Things rattle. So MidUSA came out with a cool little kit that would just provide you with the necessary spacers and shims with kind of a wave washer that you'd put in and your front to rear rocker shifter wouldn't rattle anymore. Um, might not think it's a great idea or real innovative, but actually back then it was because it was a kit you could buy that solved a problem. And since everybody worked on their own bikes or wanted to work on their own bikes, a cool little thing. Now, um, I love Dynas, everybody knows that, and I fell in love with his Dyna Super Glide that we did a road test on and convinced Harley to let us hang on to it for a year and do some little things to it, and we all rode it and took it places, and we kept a little log, and this was at about 5,000 miles to 12,000 miles. We were kind of doing an update on it, and there's one of my famous Howard on a wheelie, or Howard on a Dyna doing a wheelie, and there's... Mike taking it for a ride after we put some accessories on it, but it was part of that theme in the magazine that we really used to test things. So it was it was one of my favorite bikes, actually. Um, when I sold it to get the next one, that had a 107-inch engine in it. It was fast, handled well, a lot of fun. And now we're going to move on to the next issue. And the bike on the cover... Um, it's just cool, right? It's kind of a rubber mount FXR, chopper. Um, so in March of 03, which would have made this thing, oh, December of 03, we sent it to the printer, or December of 02, we sent it to the printer. Um, this thing we had just found at the Love Ride and it was just cool. I mean, it, it was unique and different and special and we kind of loved it, so. Moving on, we've got an ad from Performance Machine where they had their fat tail kit where you could take your standard soft tail and bolt like a 240 rear tire on it with their kit, which was really cool and definitely unique for the industry at the time. 
Um, and then we had a Corbin ad where Corbin, as you know, makes seats, but he had also made fiberglass fenders and um, saddlebags and windshields. And the wizards at the Corbin workshop were coming up with some really cool things to help you keep your soft tail looking a little different than every other soft tail on the market, which again was the goal. Um, I love, always love this ad from Mike's famous Harley Davidson. There's a V-Rod back there, but there's a girl trying to get your attention and basically Mike wanted you to come buy motorcycles. So he wanted you to know they had plenty of bikes in stock because this was 03 when, you know, the, the 100th anniversary, the bikes were starting to be more available, production was up, and now dealers needed to sell bikes because they didn't have the waiting lines anymore. Now, this was a huge deal. This was giant. This was a Yamaha ad in Hot Bike. And Yamaha had teamed up with Patrick Racing, one of the most well-known Harley performance engine builders, to turn this Yamaha into something that was going to go fast and race in classes with Harleys. And it won. And it was a big deal. And... We debated whether we were going to put this ad in the magazine or not because we knew people would get a little offended. There's a Yamaha and hot bike. and um, But at the same time, right, it was saying that the market was opening up and there were other cool bikes to look at. And you could make other things go fast that were still cruisers. Um, my editorial that month, down at the very bottom... I had to put a note that we weren't switching to being a Yamaha magazine and we weren't changing things up. But honestly, we wanted the money, so we took the ad from Yamaha because, well, we wanted the money. Um, and then here's a thing called Combustion Base, which was an editorial page that we put together for Tracy Spencer, who was just one of the absolute sharpest guys that I'd ever met that worked on motorcycles. So actually, Tracy can work on anything, but we met him doing a tech article at Pomona Harley, and then he moved over to V Twin City, um, and he wrote a tech article for us every month from the perspective of a guy that truly knew how to work on motorcycles and had insight into things that most people wouldn't have because he, again, just a super, super sharp guy. And he really made it interesting to, to do the magazine because his stuff and his ideas were really cool. Um, here's a page from our news section that features Kid Rock and um, actually Jason Britton, the stunt guy, and a couple other people from the movie that was going to be released, Biker Boys. Um, if you ever want to see a really bad motorcycle movie, find Biker Boys and watch it. Uh, it was just fun. We saw that picture. We couldn't help but put it in our news section. Um, and we wanted to see this ad from Ness because, again, Wheels, right? Something to make your bike different. But look at all the different styles of billet wheels they had available. And it was, you know, you could show up at a show like in Laughlin or Sturgis or Daytona or Laconia. And they'd, they'd bring technicians and they'd be able to put wheels on your bike and ship your old wheels home. And they did that, performance machine did that. Everybody did it back then. It was a really cool thing. So now this is a Harley Fat Boy. Well, it, it started as a Harley Fat Boy, um, and then it kind of got tweaked and worked on, but picked up on that, you know, that theory of the super clean, the super good looking, and how to make a bike look unique and different um, with just a little bit of work. So it was a very cool bike and caught everybody's attention. It was hard to believe it started out as a Harley, which was kind of cool, but. Cycle Concepts was the shop that did it, and they did a great job on it. Now, on this page, you'll also notice um, an ad from Easy Riders of Dallas, which is our good friend Rick Fairless. His store at one time was an Easy Riders shop before it became Strokers, and Rick did ads to get your attention, and that one sure would get your attention. Um, now... There's an ad from Kendall Johnson, and if you don't know Kendall, again, Kendall was the master of how to make a motorcycle fast. I think I talked about him in one of the other issues um, with a giveaway bike. Or no, it's this issue. It's coming up. So it'll come up later. I'll talk more about Kendall. Um, but this ad from SNS, something big is coming to Daytona. American Iron Horse, Arlen Ness, Ron Sims, 
Borget and Minneapolis custom cycles. I will definitely dig the issues out where we covered this, but this was when SNS was releasing their 145 cubic inch engine and they were teasing it coming up to Daytona because you were going to show up in Daytona and see these five bikes built by these five amazing builders with 145 cubic inch engines in them. And that was a big deal. Now, paint was a big deal on bikes. Chrome was a big deal on bikes. Slam to the ground was a big deal. Long fenders and open belt drive. And this bike had it all, had everything that was trendy or whatever, you know, whatever you might look for in a bike in a soft tail back when soft tails were the king of the roost. And this bike was it. And the paint was fantastic. The work that was done on the bike was fantastic. It was just really good looking and just didn't stop looking good. Now, moving on to another cool thing about the magazine, our readers and the people we were going to feature in the magazine, not only wanted to do riding shots, they wanted to do burnout shots too. And I was all on board for burnout shots. And this is Dan Roach on his Daytech framed FXR doing a big smoky burnout, which I love. Uh, it was a very cool bike, very clean, very sanitary, open belt drive, shiny. Um, I know shiny is a weird word, but just, you know, everything about that bike just screamed, look at me. And it did a good job of it. Um, notice too, we talked about Vance and Hines earlier. Um, now their ad was gigantic, right? Now they were the full page ad in color and they were way more known five years later. And uh, we did a road test on a Panzer built rigid bike. So this was a bike you could literally walk into a dealer's showroom and order it and have this cool little rigid chopper built and dropped off at your house exactly as you saw it there. Um, it was kind of cool and it was $25,000 to have this bike and a lot of nice little details and digital speedometer and a little bit of a stretch tank and good look and clean and simple. Um, also worth noticing um, is this ad for um, Holly Carbs with their, their two barrel carb, which was really something different for a Harley, a two barrel carb, right? So we actually, I think we put one on a bike once and tested it and it took a little while to get it dialed in, but once we got it dialed in, it worked well and it was certainly a conversation piece. Um, I don't know if anybody still has any of them. So as I've mentioned, mentioned and mentioned, we were heavy on tech and what we wanted to do was really get in and show how things were done and the best way to do a hop up and what would be involved and try to show you as many of the steps as possible through as many photos as possible. And of course, you know, not necessarily you're going to go do it yourself. You might go do it yourself, but we wanted to give you as much instruction or as much justification for what you were seeing or what you were going to be paying for um, with that money. So another thing I wanted you to see here is this ad from Exile Cycles. Russell Mitchell at Exile was one of the people that really had his own unique style and he was really doing things his way. And you notice I was just talking about bikes a couple pages back with fancy paint and chrome and open belt drive and shiny. And Russell's bikes were the opposite of that. It was muted and flat blacks and, and polished and nothing really shiny because um, that was the style Russell wanted. Uh, Russell and I used to go back and forth on a pretty regular basis about getting his stuff in the magazine. And I used to tease him, you know, black looks terrible on paper and need you to put some color in it, need you to make the bikes a little better to look at. And... It, it was kind of fun because we were kind of back and forth with each other and he finally painted a bike with flames and the minute he did, we went and shot it and put it in the magazine and that was, you know, fun. Um, so then we go to another event, Biketoberfest. Again, our version of Instagram, as many photos as we could jam on a page. Um, SNS offering their 107, 111, and 124 engines in their ad, which was, again, um, how great would that be, right? Buy an engine, swap it into your bike, and next thing you know, um, you have a faster bike. 
more of the uh, Biketoberfest coverage. And now, Jim Nassi, um, just what an amazing builder, what attention to detail, what cool things. And if you notice, as this bike is kind of flying by on the page, and again, back to that, we wanted to give people something to look at when they couldn't ride. Um, this bike's got a blower on it, right? Giant blower. Um, notice too, really great paint, uh, a little bit of fun with this ad from RC Components, the adult sex toys version ad. Uh, eyebrow raising, but kind of fun and in the spirit of things. So the Nassi bike, um, the paint was insane. The, the detail's insane. The blower just jumps off of the bike. And Dino's ad, all right? Dino did all the custom paint work for, for Borget, for Jim Nassi, for so many other people. And that look at the paint. Like, look at the details in it. And just the way it carries from frame to tank to fender to the oil tank and the graphics and just just super super cool stuff and you just i don't know i miss that stuff because it was so neat back then now our cover bike was like i said a bike we stumbled on at the um at the love ride but it was built by a guy named andy palmer who came from um New Zealand, came to America, did a lot of metal work for a lot of really well-known custom bike builders. And I just could not get over some of the amazing fabrication work in this bike and the details. And the more you look at it, the more you see cool little things that were done and made to make this bike look different and better. And I don't know, I miss bikes like this being around because it stood out like in a, in a crowd of bikes. You looked at this and you're just like, whoa, I need to look at that a little bit more. I need to see a little bit more about that. So moving on from that, I want to take a look at this cool little rigid built by Vince Dahl who had started a motorcycle company called Redneck Engineering. And Vince was the guy behind it, but he had a ton of guys that worked for him that were great with bike building and technicians and things like that. And Vince would show up at shows with a display and he'd have his redneck engineering shirt on. And instead of putting his name Vince on there, he'd put janitor because he did everything. And we shot this bike out in Sturgis, I think it was, by looking at the pictures and just Again, cool, um, very affordable bike back then. You know, nothing was too outrageous on it, but it was a, it was a neat little bike to look at. And um, Vince was a great guy. Uh, still around, still rides, still does cool things, but I haven't seen him in a while. And now on to yet another buyer's guide. And this was a high performance buyer's guide. This was where we were trying to gather up all the cool things you could use on your bike to make it go a little faster. and. Our buyers guys were pretty popular. Now, um, moving on to Kendall Johnson, Drag Specialty Sweepstakes. Kendall was gonna build a bike for us to give away straight out of the Drag Specialties catalog. And Kendall, incredibly talented builder, incredibly good at making bikes go fast. So he was gonna take stuff out of Drag Specialties catalog and build a custom bike that you could win by subscribing to Hot Bike and entering the contest. And it was gonna be your chance to have a Kendall Johnson custom um, for about $12 if you won. So it was kind of cool and it went on for I think four months through the magazine, but there's a quick mock-up look of what it was gonna be when it was done. And I will find the issue um, that has that bike before I wrap this series up. And, there's a cool ad from Paco, and like I said in one of the other magazine reviews, um, Paco's been around since like 69, so they've been part of this industry for forever. There's a Zippers ad, and you know, Zippers was the king of tested performance kits, where you'd buy the kit for your bike, bolt it on, and you'd get the performance that they told you you'd get if you followed their instructions. Um, I wanna jump over real quick to this ad before I get close to the end of this. That ad up on the top right was for Hot Match Customs, and that was Matt Hotch's parts business and his bike building business. And if you know anything about Matt, um, 
anybody that's ever looked at his stuff, it was clean. Everything about Matt's stuff was clean. And he offered some parts, so maybe you couldn't afford the Hot Match Custom, but you could add a couple of his parts to your bike and kind of make it a little cooler and make it a little closer to custom. And Matt had a flush mount gas cap. He had a weld on kickstand that was a super sleek design. He had these radial pipes and everything that Matt did back then was just cool and made to make you look at your bike a little different to make it a little more custom. Um, another ad that I wanna take a look at is this ad from BMC where he shows his uh, 918 Big Daddy, $21,995 for a soft tail chopper with a 100 cubic inch engine, lots of chrome, custom paint, uh, big fat rear tire. Mike was, was making a difference in the industry, um, trying to get everybody an affordable chopper, something they could get on, go riding, enjoy, um, stand out in a crowd a little bit, but not break the bank. And it was a it was a great approach. Mike had some really cool bikes, and we had one as a long-term test bike, and I'll find some of the stuff on that, show you guys a little bit about that. Um, so that's it. I'm coming basically to the end of three magazines. If you sat through this whole thing, I'm impressed because as you guys have figured out, I can talk and talk and talk. But um, if you like this, if you enjoyed it, let me know in the comments and I will make another one or two or three or four of these. Um, although I'm going to make them shorter. I'm just going to pick one magazine at a time as opposed to trying to pop all of this together at once. But I wanted this first one to kick off and really talk about you know some of the history some of the stuff behind it and the next one or two or three that i do be more focused on just the magazine content anyway thanks for listening uh looking excuse the crappy editing this is the first one i've done i'll try to make that better in the future too take care have a great day